it then stabilizes. Uh, when we embroider, we always need to stabilize the fabric because uh, often the design has multiple stitches and uh, uh, the stabilizer just gives the, like a foundation for those stitches. And the rule on what I often say is, uh, it's like a building. When you have a taller your building, better foundation you need. The same is denser your design, more foundation, more stabilizer I need. Other things that does help is just to stabilize your fabric. So if you use a cotton fabric or linen fabric, I normally use best spreads or starts. Or if it is a very, very dense design, I may even use the terial magic to kind of uh, stabilize the fabric first. And then uh, uh, I need to pack it with the embroidery, uh, embroidery stabilizer. Well, there are lots of different stabilizers available. And I just picked up some of the things from my stash because I like toys and tools. So I have multiple brands. I like to try different brands and different ones. Really doesn't matter, I guess, in, in my opinion, uh, there are a lot of companies who make really good stabilizers. And during the years, I kind of got to like certain ones better than others, but try the different ones and see which one you like the best. It can be kind of confusing when you look in the shop, all the racks of stabilizers that we have, because every company called them a little bit different names. But in general, there are three groups, three major groups that the stabilizers go in. There are tearaway stabilizers, cutaway stabilizers, and then washaway stabilizers. And then there are some specialty ones, but those are the major cap categories. Well, the tearaway stabilizers that I have on, on this image on the uh, left-hand side, I have some in there from the embroidery store, some from the baby locks, and then I, I believe a Floriani one there as well. Well, these stabilizers, they are kind of your basic stabilizer that anytime when you have uh, woven fabric or staple fabric, this stabilizer works very well because they are kind of like paper. They are just a non-woven material. They're made in a machine like a paper mill, like a paper machine. So they have, it's a, it's a paper-like, but they are fibers that um, they, they have other than just the uh, cellulose, I guess. I don't know exactly well how it's made, but uh, this, uh, uh, the, it's a, uh, um, run like on the paper and they tear kind of like paper. These stabilizers come different ways. They come as uh, 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 different ways, medium and some are lightweight and some of the ones may heavy, be heavyweight. Even if you just have a single weight, maybe medium weight and you need more, you can always double it up also. So this one from the baby lock says a tear away firm. Baby lock also has it tear away uh, soft and the same with the embroidery store, the dime now, they have it also under, uh, soft and firm. What that means is that the firm, the fibers are shorter, so they will tear easier. The soft is a bit softer, it's kind of a hybrid between a cutaway stabilizer and a tearaway stabilizer, so they uh, have a little bit, uh, uh, not denser, but they don't tear as easily. So uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it just has kind of a longer fibers on it. So they, um, so if I want to have a very clean finish in the edge, like some of the, in the whole project, I like to use a tearaway firm. If I have a uh, project that needs a little bit more stabilizing, then I may use a tearaway soft. Or if I go on to the knit fabric, so any kind of a, uh, non, uh, a thread, uh, any stretchy fabrics, non-stable fabrics, that's when I would use then the cutaway stabilizer. Because cutaway then, when it goes from that uh, tearaway soft to cutaway, those uh, um, fibers are then much longer and those stabilizers, you have to cut them out. That's why they call them cutaway. The cutaway stabilizers come on different weights. Let me move this one out. They come with the uh, kind of a um, medium and light and really heavy weight uh, cutaways. But then they also come very thin ones, the no-show mess. And uh, these stabilizers are used a lot also on some of the in the whole projects, especially quilt blocks, because you can leave the stabilizer in. They are uh, just like almost fabric-like. You can't tear these ones. They are lightweight, but you can't tear them. And, and these ones come uh, on fusible and non-fusible. So I could have each roll of those ones. And here's kind of also shows that I have no so uh, fusible and then just a no so mess. This table also comes on three colors. There are some of the other ones, the cutaway and tearaways, come black and white, but this one comes black, white, and beige. Uh, the reason I have the beige one in a fusible one is because I like using this one on uh, white t shirts. 
Why this color? Because uh, if I put the white stabilizer on a uh, back a back in on for the uh, white t-shirt, it kind of show, shows, shows through a little bit. But if I put more of less color on there, it, uh, the stabilizer edge doesn't shine through. So that is the reason. So this is really designed for white t-shirts or light, uh, kind of a, a white lightweight fabrics. Well then, uh, so that is again, so those are the no-show mesh stabilizers, but then the, uh, these, uh, these ones, they also come with the normal kind of a cutaway, a little bit heavier ones. In a commercial industry, they use a lot of the, just the basic cutaway. That was kind of the first stabilizer, I believe, that came out. Well then, several stabilizers come also other than fusible, like this one in, in what I put as example, is a wet and stick. It's a sticky cutaway. It can either be a, a, a pressure sensitive or water activated. This one is a tearaway that uh, is a Floriani tearaway. I have it on a big microl. Uh, this one has a surface on, so that will score the surface side and it becomes sticky stabilizer then. This is a tearaway. This one is a water activated sticky uh, stabilizer. So on this surface, I would have to just to uh, hope it and I wet the surface and it will become tacky. So it will then uh, hold the fabric on, in place. Because you get the best results on, on your embroidery when you have your stabilizer and the fabric bonded together. Whether you use the iron on, and I think you should show that one too. Uh, most embroidery machines, they do come with a little sample stabilizer that is the iron on stabilizer. So that, um, that is a little tearaway stabilizer and a little sampler pack that comes with the machine. So that, uh, those ones, if you iron it in the background, it kind of pulls the fabric and the stabilizer together. You always, always get best results that way. So uh, you could use that or you could use then the sticky one that's water activated or even the pressure sensitive. So any stabilizer, those ones that don't have sticky built-in or fusible built-in, you can make them low and bond it to the fabric uh, by using a temporary spray adhesive. 505 is the one I use a lot. At the Salty KK2000 is another really good brand. And then if you use this one and you just have hooked your uh, stabilizer spray that one and you get lots of that over spray, I, would, I want to remind her, do not ever ever spray this beside your machine because uh, when your machine is on, there's a fan on and that, that fan would suck all that extra over spray. And we have had a number of machines come in a shop that has too much glue inside. So they, and it's really hard to take out because it gets all the gears. So I want to try to spray outside. My sewing room is beside the front door, so I can go outside in the, uh, and uh, just to spray there. Or also, if you have any breathing issues, um, uh, you may want to wear a mask or then definitely don't inhale those ones. So it's just, uh, it's a great stuff, but just it, it, you always get some overspray. But then sometimes you still get overspray on the edge of the hoop and it's a little hard to clean the hoops. Question I often get, well, that is a magic one for that one, DK5. Uh, it will clean all these kind of stickies, so you can just to spray that on the hoop, use a paper towel and wipe that uh, extra spray adhesive off. Also, if you get it on any surface, uh, you can do that too. And then I use it for taking labels out. And I made a little technique Tuesday uh, short video about that one recently too. So those are other kind of products that can be used for the, uh, uh, for the embroidery. Then we have the third category that is the water soluble stabilizers and they come two ways. They come on uh, the, sorry to kick the camera, they come on like a fabric like. This one is the mess of uh, different companies call it different names. Baby Lock calls it the dissolve away mess uh, uh, and then uh, Floriani calls it um, wet and gone. So it, uh, it's a, uh, usually used on uh, freestanding lace, but anytime you need to have a stabilizer that you want totally to disappear, you can use that one. It also comes on uh, 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 the uh, sticky version. So that way I, I would just hook, the, hook this one's quarter surface and then I pull the release paper out, release the stackiness, and then I can use that. Um, the water soap stabilizers, there's the other kind of, really not a stabilizer at all, is a topping. This is the first kind of a water soluble uh, stabilizer or topping that came out. Uh, often people refer this still as uh, 
at the Salki Soldi because I think they was the first one to come out. But m multiple companies make the same, and I have some samples. They uh, they just uh, look like plastic, but these ones are used to uh, cover on a nap when you have a fabric that uh, has a nap surface, uh, so they're going to cover that one. So these stabilizers, um, that, because they are water soluble, I keep these ones in the Ziploc bag. Because uh, if I leave them out, out without an, any um, airtight, either container or the bag, they will uh, uh, kind of uh, leave with the environment. So if it is very humid, it will suck all the moisture and they may become a lump. So I, I kind of keep these ones in a plastic bag or container. And then we have, a, those are not major, but then we have another kind of topping, which is a, the heat away topping. And I have one example on this one, which is the Salki heat away. Uh, Floriani is a really good brand for that. Baby Lock has similar one and also the Dime company. So pretty much every company has a heat away topping. So instead of uh, uh, using the uh, water soluble topping, this is the best one to use with uh, Terry towels. Because that stabilizer uses stir the excess out and then uh, on the top, and then you will uh, just use the tip of the iron to melt the rest of it, but what you can't tear, easily tear. And whatever is inside the stitches stays there permanently. So that way you get the best results with the terry towel as a topping for that one. So it's kind of a, the extra specialty one. And there are a few other specialty ones that are not really stabilizers, but the things I use it in embroidery, like a puffy foam uh, that makes a three-dimensional embroidery. Uh, then um, for applique, we often use some of the like, applique wonder or the Pellon um, e uh, Easy Steam. So these are backing for the applique and they're great for em uh, embroidery appliques too. So I just kind of really, really quickly went through the stabilizers because I do really very thorough class every once in a while in the shop, a two hour talk about the stabilizers. And, uh, and then we have lots of the uh, embroidery educators uh, do it in the events. Those are the best ones to come always to get the information from the, uh, the company educators because they tell the information that uh, uh, they uh, from the manufacturers. But really, really good tool. Uh, embroidery compass. This one uh, was uh, developed by Deborah Jones and we have had her twice in our shop to do an event. Uh, it's now under the Dime brand, but this one um, is a great way to, uh, if you are wondering what all of these stabilizers, where would I use them? So you will just dial on this one, the type of fabric you'll be sewing. Like if I have knits, lightweight t-shirts, onesies. So I will just uh, dial this uh, compass to area that uh, what I'm doing. And then it will tell me that, yes, I should use a no-show mess for the left chest size, right waist cutaway for the larger designs. So it tells me what kind of cutaway stabilizer I should use. But then also tells in here recommended needles, the type of needle, and then also the size of the needle. And then finally some comments, like it says, hook with the stabilizer to reduce the uh, shifting, apply embroidery spray adhesive to stabilizer, adhere the reverse side of the fabric before hooping. So she has, uh, she's, she comes from the commercial embroidery side. So she has put all her experience and uh, manufacturer's knowledge on this compass. So there are two sides, there's all kinds of different materials. If I do caps or denim, so this is a great tool for uh, just to uh, uh, go through to see, uh, help, especially in the beginning, what is the good stabilizer, uh, because that makes a huge difference on your quality of the embroidery designs. Other great tool is the Floriani app. Uh, Floriani has three apps. There's a needle app, stabilizer app, and a thread app. Those can be downloaded from the app store, whether it is uh, the Mac device or Android. And uh, then you can use those uh, apps also to get similar kind of information about the Floriani stabilizers, threads, and needles. It's a reminder that lots of these stabilizer, stabilizers do come with really, really good information. Like the Floriani, they always put a, a piece of paperwork inside. And I like to keep that one with the stabilizer, so that way I have the information. But if I lose this one from the Floriani, I can always go on their website and download the entire stabilizer worksheet. So I could get that from uh, an addition one. But I try to I try to keep the, that information. Other one I like to keep also is the label that came with the stabilizer. So this one, I just used a little wrap 
to uh, hold it in place. So I try to keep those, whether I put it inside of the stabilizer or just kind of a, uh, wrap around. Then I don't have to try to guess that uh, what brand was it and what kind of stabilizer. Uh, here's another kind of really uh, nice specialty stabilizer from Baby Lock. Uh, it's called the Ultra Soft Fusible. It really is in the facing. But it's a great one if you do some of the quilt box uh, and you want to have just a little bit of a stabilizer. And this one comes with the long 20 inch, uh, 20 inch uh, 5 yards in a row. It's a really nice, soft, thin stabilizer or in the facing, but it is fusible. So I use that on a number of the wall hangings because uh, I just kind of fallen in love with it. So I got two rolls of it. So that's another specialty kind of not really a stabilizer. It's more like an interfacing. Just a little summary of the stabilizers. So the major categories of the stabilizers are the cutaway, tailway, and washaway. And then we have some specialty ones. The cutaway is designed for knit fabrics, so anything that is non-stable. You can use it with the wovens or two, but it's usually definitely needed for knits. And then the tailway, that is needed for uh, when you have a stable woven fabric. So never ever with the uh, knits. Wash away, rinse away, water soluble, multiple names for that one. There are two types of that stabilizer. Either a topping, which really isn't a stabilizer. It's a topping to keep the nap down on a towel, so velvet, or anything that has a nap surface or uneven surface. And then we have a little bit heavier one, uh, a mesh type of one. That one is used for uh, pre-standing lace. And then some other applications where all the stabilizer needs to be removed. And then uh, there are some specialty ones, like the heat away topping, which is a great one on items that they have, especially if you can't wash them to remove it, but definitely on towels, will keep that nap down there permanently. Then kind of I listed in here so sticky. Well, several of those stabilizers, the cut away, tear away, and wash away, they come also on a sticky version. Either they might be a, um, the pressure sensitive, where you peel it out and uh, expose the sticky part, but then there are also the ones that uh, is water activated or iron on. And then um, I listed on this one too, are the permanent toppings. There are some heavier toppings that can be on top of the uh, designs on the items when you have a lighter color thread on a dark color background. Uh, that dark color tends to kind of shine through the really light color thread. So if you put a permanent uh, light color topping on it, it'll kind of a, give a little extra layer between the threads and the surface so that dark background won't show through. And then for dimensional embroidery, puffy foam is great for that one. Uh, fusible tricot, uh, I just kind of had generic name for that one. But there are uh, several kinds of uh, uh, not really stabilizers, they're more like a fabric prep that uh, will uh, either can be used to give extra body for the fabrics. Uh, I use them often with the silks. Uh, the Dreamweave Fusible from Floriani is a really good one for that. Or then it can be ironed on afterwards to cover the stitches, for especially if you sew on the little baby clothing and uh, that background where the uh, head knot, uh, is tied in, those little knots can be otherwise irritating on the sensitive skin. So you cover that background with the fusible tricot and uh, that way it will be smooth also against the skin. And then actually I didn't mention on the list in, in there, but there's a kind of on this cutaway, the no show mess, uh, similar kind of one, exquisite or the dime brand now. Uh, there's a great polypro performance, a special stabilizer designed to sew on the, uh, those uh, moisture wicking uh, flimsy kind of a sportswear items. It's a little bit heavier than the no show mess, but it is a really great stabilizer for that one. And then I mentioned that we can then also use the temporary spray adhesives to bond the fabric and the stabilizer together. And then the embroidery compass, a great tool for figuring out what stabilizer is the best one, what needle is the best, and some other tips. I'm going to go through some of the hooping tips, some of my favorite ones, but there are many other ways to do the hooping. There's lots of the things in the sewing. We have more than one way to do things. The, uh, the hoops that we have, they have two parts. Uh, the outer ring and the inner ring. If you are um, being a hand embroiderer, you would normally put your inner ring down, put your fabric on top of it, and then you put your outer ring on top. Machine embroidery, we do the opposite. 
on the machining brody, the outer ring will go on the surface and then the inner ring goes on top. Uh, these hoops kind of hard to most likely see in the camera, but we have little markings on these hoops. So if I'm going to show up in there, they are, there's a little, there's a little uh, triangle. And then also on the outer ring, there's a little triangle. Kind of hard to see in the camera, but little indentation. What these are designed to do is that we will line up these two, uh, two markings. Uh, well, can I put it this way? Absolutely, I can. It still works. But if you uh, uh, if you use the hoop templates, those uh, grids that came with some of the hoops, uh, then uh, uh, that way, if I line it up this way, and then I will line up uh, also the template that the ABC, the letters are uh, towards me, then that uh, center part on that template will show exactly where the center of the hoop is. Because some uh, these hoops we have other markings, we have little notches on the, on the uh, on both sides. They are approximately in the middle. Several hoops they might be exactly in the middle, especially the horizontal one. But some of the ones they are not exactly in the middle. So if I line up my, my fabric with these ones with the crosshairs, I may not have it exactly in the middle. Of course, we can still move the design in the machine unless your design is so large that there's no space to move it. But if I wanted to have it lined up exactly with the center needle position, uh, then, I, then I would use the, uh, if I put the hoop the right way and then use the grid, that will allow me to make sure that I get my item hooped straight and also with the, with the uh, correct center position. I don't have the grids for my machine because uh, the Luminaire and Solaris, they stop sipping these grids. Uh, all these uh, hoops we have a, uh, uh, the uh, release screw, depending on the hoops. Several ones, this uh, the screw, actually, the, uh, we can lift it up. And it is just more uh, ergonomic because then we don't have to pull the hoop away of the table to tighten it. Some of the uh, more basic machines uh, and the older hoops, we may not have them this way. And I have another hoop that is the five by seven that has a different kinds of a screw on this one. This one doesn't have the one that comes with the manufacturer. This was one kind of a third party item I had got on one time. It was uh, a little bit less expensive than the manufacturer's hoop and I can see why. It's not as convenient to use this one. So I do like to use the ones that uh, the manufacturer, the baby lock and brother has that uh, they uh, flip it over. So that way I can easier tighten it and loosen it just without pulling it off the edge of the table. So Lars and Lumine, they ask uh, this large, largest hoop, we have a different kind of a uh, locking mechanism. It's a little lever. And on this case, I would first tighten my screw uh, to the correct position and then uh, uh, pro, uh, bring the lock in. Uh, not really recommended to tighten it afterwards. So if I didn't have it tight enough, I would open it up, tighten a little bit more, and then close it again. So these are at only on the Solaris Illuminator, the largest hoop, and then the one that comes with the upgrade one. So I'm going to use the 5x7 for the demonstration because it just fits be, uh, better in the camera than those really large hoops. So you want to open the hoop uh, uh, outer ring enough that you can take the inner ring out. And I want to point out that uh, I have a little extra piece attached on my inner ring. Uh, this a little uh, tape, a little tacky tape. It just holds my fabric tighter, especially on the straight uh, longer sides of the hoop. This is a small hoop, but longer they go, uh, we don't get as much support on the sides on, on the rectangular shaped hoops. So this way I have, a, it's, uh, it's kind of like in the hand embroidery, I was told always to wrap your inner ring, the part of the hoop with a twill tape. And that way, it will keep that little extra grip on the fabric. Well, what I use mine is a hoop grip. And I recently got me a new package because I had finished my old one. This one is, is a tape that um, uh, you just uh, uh, put it on the, on, the, on the inner ring. And it's just the right thickness for the most of the home embroidery machine rings. I use it also with my multi-needle. And it just goes around, and in this case, what you'll do, you will peel out this uh, uh, yellow. That is where the sticky part is that goes onto the hoop. And then this yellow uh, is a release that you'll throw away. 
and it will stay there until some point they uh, just then you know, maybe start uh, peeling off a bit or get so uh, linty that they ha they're not tacky anymore. It's just a slightly tacky. It just holds my fabric better. Especially very good when you do freestanding uh, lace and you use this uh, uh, no saw mess, sorry, the, uh, water soluble mess stabilizers. Uh, because the freestanding lace designs are usually quite dense and then that stabilizer is a little bit slippery. So we have just single layer stabilizer and that heavy embroidery, it often pulls that uh, stabilizer off the edges. Well, that just keeps it nicely in place. So I have it on several of my hoops. I have used that hoop grip. Well, then what I need to have is uh, uh, some stabilizer and I'm just going to use this. Uh, this happened to be a cutaway stabilizer, but I'm going to use this one. The important part is that your stabilizer is larger, about an inch on all the sides of the hoop. This is the time not to be skimpy. So we need to have the stabilizer to be larger than the hoop. The 12 inch stabilizer just so happens uh, perfectly fits for this hoop or 8 by 12 if I put it other way around. I have some stabilizers uh, and the 15 inch rolls because some of, uh, and 20 inch rolls because those lots of hoops I need to have a bigger rolls. Also, sometimes the last rolls are kind of nice because even if I use smaller hoops, I don't really waste any, any stabilizer. I just cut the piece I need. So again, I'm just going to cut the piece that, that is, a little, oops, <laughs> is a little bit bigger than my hoop. And this stabilizer that I used happened to have a little bit of uh, that uh, uh, glue on it. And this was the uh, wet, um, uh, wet and stick. So it's water activated stabilizer. I could have used uh, the standard one and just to use the 505 or KK2000 uh, spray adhesive, but I don't want to uh, spray inside my sewing room and I don't want to really be running in and out in here uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, presentation. So I'm going to just use this uh, stabilizer because I always get best results if I put my fabric and stabilizer together. So um, I'm just going to give a little spray. This is just the water I have it on this bottle and uh, just to smooth it out and I let it kind of sit just a little bit and it, it becomes tacky. And how to unrelease it is you just wet it again and it will unrelease. And then I will take my piece of fabric and I will just lay that on top. That little scrap that I'm using and I just smooth it on top. So that way they are bonded together. I did... Uh, iron this one and I used a little bit of a best press to kind of give a little extra stiffness. If I, my design is very dense and my fabric is very lightweight, I may even use Terrial Magic or then Ordinary Starts. But that will kind of always help for the fabric if I uh, give a little bit more body for it in addition for the stabilizer. So now I'm going to put the, in, in, uh, the outer in underneath, put my fabric on top and then I will uh, put my uh, my out, uh, inner ring on top of it. Well, how would I line this one up? Now we have multiple ways to do this one. Uh, Dime has a really cool product that uh, it's a little, uh, it's called PAL laser light that uh, you can reflect cross hair. So that'll help you align your design exactly perfectly straight. Um, or then other options, I could use those grid ma uh, grids that come with several hoops. Well, my machine didn't come with the grids, so I'm going to do other little way that do. I'm going to mark a center, and this time I'm just going to do a finger press on this one. May not show very well in the camera, but it'll give me an uh, indication where my, my center of the hoop would be. It gives me a little bit more uh, straight. And I purposely use the fabric with the pattern so I can use some of the other features on my machine. So let me put this, uh, see, am I still in the camera if I move things around? So I'm going to lay my, actually I'm going to move my outer ring away. I'm going to put this inner ring and I'm going to use some of these notches, even though they may not be exactly, but they're close enough for my purpose because I can still move my design. So I'm going to line up those notches. Uh, accordingly where my, my uh, crease marks were. And then I'm going to pinch from the sides, move it on the hoop, and then I will uh, start from the top end, slide it down and put it down. Notice mine was pretty tight on this one. I had opened this uh, outer ring just enough to get my fabric and my stabilizer in it. 
because that way I don't have to really tighten this very much. I have really nicely uh, hooped uh, um, fabric already. Because if I open this a lot, let me just show another way. If I do open this a lot, and let me just get my fabric again. So I'll open it a lot. As the one thing is when you open it a lot, make sure you don't open it so much that that screw comes out because then this little metal piece falls out. And just to try to find it and put it back in, but uh, so avoid opening it so much. If you have bulky item, obviously you have to open it more. And some of the like 7 by 12 hoop has the, uh, this uh, uh, screws, these adjustment screws on both ends. But all the others, we just have one end. So let me get that one again, try to line up close in there. So now if I put it in here, and it, it just goes easier if I have it open more. But what happen easily if I open this a lot more, when I start tightening this one, see I start pulling a little bubble on, 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 on that section. And that bubble may be not really showing too much, but I start seeing looseness on this part of the hoop. And tendency really would be in, the, in this one, now that when I tighten it all the way. So see, this is all loose and then kind of a little, little wrinkle on the other side. Well, what, what, what the tendency tend to be to try to pull from the corners. Well, woven fabric, I would be pulling now on bias. So I could get my fabric out of shape. So I'll, normally I try to avoid pulling with the corners. I may have to sometimes do a little tuck on the sides to kind of have it uh, all smooth and flat. But I try to avoid pulling from the corners. So if I notice my hoop was so loose that I had to do that, uh, 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 tighten it many times, I'm going to precondition the hoop. That was some of the word I heard from the uh, embroidery specialist that we have had in the shop. And then let me smooth this one out again. And I will just re-hoop it. So instead of trying to tighten it this one, I tightened the hoop alone, had my fabric flat. And then now I barely had to tighten it at all. Again, I have pretty good grip on my fingers. I always say I was, I'm a farm girl, so I have a very good grip on my fingers. But if you need, obviously, you can always use the screwdriver to tighten it a little bit more. And this multifunction tool is really good. Because if I put that one onto the position three, it will just really nicely goes over this. Uh, and I can keep a, even little bit more that I couldn't do with my uh, fingers. So that's a great tool. We also have some other tools in the shop that are um, uh, the little hoop screwdrivers that go over this this uh, hoop screw well. Well now I cut this one already well hooked in here and what I want to have it to be quite drum tight so that I don't have slacks uh, so that it's really nice and tight. I said I could give a little tuck on the side to make sure if something slipped a bit, but I try to avoid pulling it from the corners to stretch the bias, and especially if you are uh, embroidering knit fabrics. And that is why the knit fabric is very important that you have your fabric and the stabilizer bonded together. Well, then there are lots of other helping to, uh, uh, hoop, hel helpful hooping tools. Um, what happens, uh, this was easy to hook because it was a small piece of material. But if I have some bigger piece and then I'm trying to uh, locate my uh, bottom of my hoop, I just put self liner uh, on my table. So that kept my bottom hoop really nicely not, uh, from moving. Uh, but there is much better product than this one. And I makes this as a fairly new product and I think they are still in the back order at the shop. Uh, but uh, we had an event uh, recently and the educator when he, he showed us, he was uh, 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 just uh, uh, telling about this one and uh, uh, everyone who tried it was just was totally amazed about it. So those ones, it's a, um, it's a uh, hooping surface. It gets, it's like a little silicone kind of a uh, mat that uh, has grid lines. So you can line up your hoop on the grid lines and then if you use that little laser light even uh, align it, you could get really good hooping results. Well, I don't have that because like I said, they're in back order. So I'm sure that they'll be coming in one of these days. So I just put the self liner on my table in this time. It's like, it's just a, when I didn't have any better ones. Well, that kept my bottom hoop so I didn't have to chase it around. But then sometimes when you have the Top hoop and let me get my, oh, I did tighten this really tight. Let me loosen just a little bit so I can put it back in. 
sometimes they go, how would I keep my inner ring from moving? Well, this hoop grip kind of helped me a lot already because it sort of kept my uh, hoop in place uh, whenever I pinch it between my fingers. But then other options would be to use double-sided tape. And this one uh, is the RNK Stitch Perfection Tape. Mine, this is an older one, but the, the newer ones are water soluble. Really doesn't matter whether it is a wonder tape or any of these kind of double-sided uh, double tapes. Even ordinary double-sided tape would work. So if I take some of this one, let me cut the piece of it. And I would put the tape on, the, on my hoop. And then if I just peel the paper, this, the, this is the hardest part always to get the release paper out. Here I just use the pin to score the surface a little bit and then I can peel out these uh, release papers. And I just put on two ends. So now I have a little bit extra stickiness on my hoop uh, on bottom side so that way it will hold it in place there too. So let me line it up again somewhere around my lines that I had pressed. And then when I stick this one in place, so that will kind of hold my fabric and hoop so that they don't move as, as easy. And then I can move my, uh, my sandwich. Again, I usually start from the top edge because that's the one that uh, uh, we, we don't have the, re the release screw. And I just, again, I just had it so that I, I don't have to really tighten this much at all. Maybe give one little couple little turns on this one. Other things that I want to point out, uh, many times on the instructions tell you to push this inner ring further in. The manufacturer, Baby Lock and Brother, do not recommend doing that one. They even have some little notches and some of the hoops kind of prevent doing that one. But it is important that they are level, so that they are lined up, so that I don't have one uh, sticking out too much. So I need to have them level. So I usually go around and just kind of pinch between my fingers so that... Uh, they are level, but don't push it uh, uh, further out. That is not what the manufacturer recommends. So here it is. Here's my hooping. And again, that was just some of the tips that I had, what, what I was using on mine. So, and many other ways to do that. For the embroidery designs, we also need a design to embroider. And one thing to look about embroidery designs is that uh, they do come on different formats. It's like a language. Different machines will understand different languages. The baby lock and brother, they all understand the PES, uh, uh, that format. But the multi-needle machines and also several others, especially the larger machines, they can also read the DSD format. It's, it's a Tajima commercial format that does not include any color information. So if you have a design on that format, the colors will look really weird because that is just as a needle uh, number that uh, is used on a multi-needle but we can use those designs on the multi mill and the larger embroidery machines too. But there are lots of other formats because every company kind of wanted to have their own format that only their machine understands. So I just listed some of the ones and may not be all of it, but several on that one. So if you have had another brand machine and then you get the baby lock or brother machine, so you may have a whole bunch of some of these other formats. Well, they can be converted either using the software or then uh, if you really have a very, very old kind of ones, I think you might still be able to get magic box or amazing box. Not sure anymore, but this was the uh, way to convert old uh, uh, embroidery cards, things that were not on the memory sticks or uh, any kind of CDs. And then just a reminder that if you save a design from the baby lock or brother machine to a USB stick, that design is not going to be shown as a PES. It will be saved as PHC on most machines. On the Luminae and Solaris, it will be saved as PHX. So it will kind of be surprising when you look the design that you saved from the machine, the memory stick, that it no longer says PES. That is the machine's internal format. And all the uh, Baby Lock and Brother machines, they can also read the PHC. And then the Solaris and Luminae can read, in addition, also the PHX. Well, how do the designs come? Well, of course, we have a whole bunch of that are built in in a machine. Every machine has a little bit different set of designs. Early on, when we start, when we got more designs, they they came in design cards. And you may, if you have been embroidering for a while, you may still have some of the cards. 
And if you uh, uh, want to use those cards, if you haven't copied those designs yet out of those cards, uh, we might still have available uh, or order a card reader that can be plugged into a US port, a port in a machine that those design cards can be used. But that's really going back now way over 10 years ago when the designs came in a card. Then one point we had machines that use floppy disks and they, they are able to put the floppy disk right onto the machine. Well, now it's very hard to get floppy disk. So now normally when we get the embroidery designs, they either come on a CD, some comes in a memory stick, or then we can download them from internet. There are lots of free ones in the internet and also some of the ones that you have to put your credit card information to purchase them. And then of course, every software package, if you have any embroidery software, they usually come with some designs too. Plus then you can of course create your own designs. But then as a reminder, I always want to talk about a little bit, this is my legal part in here. Uh, remember to read the copyright information because embroidery designs are kind of like music. We don't really own that one. We only own the right to use it. So what it means is kind of, that you again, think about this like, uh, uh, um, like the um, CDs or, or mu uh, movies. I can uh, uh, watch the movie if I purchase a movie, but I can't start, uh, start charging tickets for that one. Meaning that there are some of these embroidery collections that they do not allow you to sell this item. Disney is one of those ones. And actually, I even copied from the Brother Manual what they tell about in the, it's a direct copy of the manual about the copyright. That all those patterns that are sold in the machine, they are pro, uh, 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 protected by the uh, copyright uh, laws. So it's just kind of a reminder that those are not to be shared. They are not meant to be, or, uh, and especially Disney ones, you're not allowed to even sell the item if you embroider it. That varies a lot between manufacturers. So it's always it's important if you are selling items that you have in, um, embroidered, maybe, uh, maybe you uh, have an Etsy shop or so, uh, sell them somewhere, make sure that the design you're using allows you to do that one because it's, it takes all the fun out if we get the lawyer calling about that one. So it's just again reminder that uh, they, uh, they, these are intellectual properties by the designers and uh, uh, just to uh, check on the copyright. So we, no, we are not meant to share these designs, we are meant to have our own copies. It kind of sounds funny, I put embroidery stitches. Well, yeah, it is a stitch. However, the sewing machines, the needle only goes up and down in the same spot and the embroidery hoop uh, is moved underneath to put the needle in the right position. But the difference comparing, comparing the stitches in the sewing machine and embroidery side is that um, on a sewing side, we normally have a balance stitch. Embroidery side, we don't want to have that top and pop, popping thread meeting in the middle of the fabric. We want to the ha have the uh, top thread wrapped around a little bit on the side. And here's just, just an image from the manual that shows that how your top thread is meant to as only so on the top side, and you should see a little bit of top thread underneath also. And then one of the questions I sometimes get from the new embroiderers is that, how come my machine changes speed while it's embroidering? That is normal. It changes the speed according to length, the length of the stitch that it's doing. And then just a reminder, the threads are under tension, so they always, always pull a little bit. But the well digitized designs, they've been uh, minimized already for, by the use of a term, uh, term called pull compensation. So they do a little overshoot on those designs already. So it should be, uh, with this well digitized design, we, we should have the outlines perfectly lining up. But other thing is, it's still important that you use the correct stabilizer and tighten that screw in the hoop well enough that the, uh, the fabric can't move inside the hoop when it is being stitched. And then just a reminder, I mentioned on my live uh, demo that I like using the hoop grip uh, around the edge of the embroidery hoop because that will really help to uh, not to have the fabric to move inside the embroidery frame. So we have multiple stitches actually in the embroidery designs. Uh, you often see in the bigger area that the uh, uh, when it's been filled with the fill stitches, that there's an underlay, there's little open stitches that go uh, under first and then it gets covered with the solid stitching. That is a very important uh, stitch uh, because it will attach the fabric and stabilize it together so that the fabric can't move underneath when it starts doing the more dense fill. 
Then some of the uh, fill areas have been filled with the satin stitches when they are doing narrow areas. If your satin stitch is longer than seven millimeters, that's normally is kind of the rule that no longer than seven, then that design should be used, used uh, should use the step fill, which is kind of like a hand embroidery. If you have a wider area, you need to kind of break that stitch between. Same rules apply in embroidery. That is just how the designs have been digitized. So when you look the design, how it shows, you see some of this uh, detail. And sometimes they do that fill as a little pattern or fancy fill. Sometimes you may have an outline stitch around the design, and it can be a satin stitch or straight stitch or triple straight, which is called a beam stitch. We also have embroidery designs that have been digitized as cross stitches. And then uh, if you have a machine that does not cut the jump stitches, that means that when the, uh, uh, the, there's a design that the, uh, the same color is used in another part, uh, it may just to, uh, tie the stitches on one spot and jump into the next one. So there's a little th a thread that goes on top and the bottom of the fabric. So after it uh, finishes embroidering, you need to trim those jump stitches out. And it's good to trim them uh, between each color so that the other color don't stitch over them. Uh, all the bigger machines, they do have now jump stitch cuttings. So anything that uh, less than five millimeters, uh, those jump stitches get cut automatically. But some of the smaller ones, we had to manually trim those ones. Then we can also do embroidery applique. There are designs that way, and there are some, you may see the term applique placement stitches. And then some models, we also have sewing machine stitches. So yeah, we do have different stitches in the embroidery side too.